Throughout this week on 4 Extra, we've been remembering Charles Chilton, who died a year ago at the age of 95. He produced over 150 specialist radio programmes, and this one, from 1972, was part of a series made by the BBC for schools called Radio Vision. Do you remember it? These were sound programmes broadcast for schools to record, and pupils were able to look at accompanying sets of slides or colour film strips for use with a stills projector. Between 30 and 45 images were provided for each programme. Radio Vision began as an experiment in the 1960s, and it continued until 1990. Anyway, back to this particular programme, for which you'll just have to imagine the slides. It charts the history of slavery and the American Civil War through songs and eyewitness accounts. Written by Charles Chilton and narrated by John Westbrook, this is Lincoln Frees the Slaves. <laughs> In 1783, after a long war for independence, 13 former British colonies broke away from the mother country to unite as free and independent states into a single nation. By 1850, the original 13 states had grown to 31. There were also territories, as they were called, in the West, which had not yet become states. But the whole area was now becoming divided into two opposing groups the go-ahead, industrial, energetic North, and the leisurely, cultured, slave-owning, conservative South. Slavery was a large millstone around the southern neck. The South's economy was based on one main product, cotton, grown, picked and baled by slave labour. I wish I was in the land of cotton, old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. In Dixieland where I was born in early young one frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Then I wish I was in Dixie. Hooray, hooray. In Dixieland I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixie. Away, away. Away down south to Dixie, away, away, away down south to Dixie. Negroes work in fresh air and sunlight. Negroes is too valuable to be given dangerous or killing tasks. They're cared for in sickness and old age. The slums of northern cities would be considered a disgrace to a slave plantation. But if bondage was such a blessing, why did slaves run away? Why did they pine for freedom? When a slave owner expressed his sympathy to a young slave on the death of his mother, the Negro replied, Yes, sir. She's dead. But she's free. Tonight the bondman lord is bleeding in his chains and loud the falling lash is heard on Carolina's plains. Slavery became a political issue. In 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska law ruled that these territories should decide about slavery for themselves. But we northerners are determined that Kansas shall be admitted as a free state. The South is determined she will become a slave state. Among the more violent abolitionists in Kansas was John Brown, a religious maniac. In 1859, he thought up a scheme for capturing the U.S. arsenal at Harper's Ferry. He intended to arm the Negroes in the surrounding countryside and to incite a rebellion. His plot failed. Troops stormed the arsenal. Brown was arrested, tried and found guilty of murder. He captured Harper's Ferry with his 90 men so few And he frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and through They hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitor crew But his truth is marching on Glory, glory,
The Kansas question was a godsend to the new Republican Party. Republicans were not pro-slavers, nor were they abolitionist, but they were opposed to the spread of slavery to Western territories. No Republican dared to show his face in the South. Least of all, a distinguished member of the party from Illinois, who was now a lawyer, but had once been a rail splitter. Rail splitters split logs into the lengths used for wooden fencing. This one's name was Abraham Lincoln. I was born February twelfth, eighteen o nine, in a log cabin in Kentucky. In my eighth year, we moved to Spencer County, Indiana. There I grew up. There were some schools, so called. I could read, write, and do simple arithmetic, but that was all. I have not been to school since. I worked as a clerk in a store, studied law, and entered politics. But I was not really interested until the fight over the Kansas-Nebraska bill. Then I was roused as by the sound of a fire bell at night. When in 1858 he campaigned for a seat in the Senate, he was not elected. But his speeches were remembered, especially his stress on the importance of not allowing the slavery issue to split the Union. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. In 1860, the Republicans nominated Abraham Lincoln as their candidate for the presidency. Electors were not allowed to forget. That he had once been a humble railmaker. They'll find what by failing and boring our railmaker statesmen can do. For the people are everywhere calling for Lincoln and liberty too. Then up with the banner so glorious, the stars. The South thought very differently. One of their posters showed Lincoln as a dangerous lunatic, supported by irresponsibles. Another made the intentions of at least one Southern state absolutely clear. If that rail-spitting baboon Abraham Lincoln is elected, it will split the Union. In November 1860, Lincoln was elected, though he would not actually become president until March 1861. South Carolina seceded on December the twentieth, eighteen sixty. By February eighteen sixty one, seven states had followed her, and the Confederate States of America had been formed with Jefferson Davis as president. The Confederacy used various flags and finally adopted this one. The flag of South Carolina consisted of only one huge star on a blue ground. Here's to our Confederacy, strong we are and brave. Like patriots of old, we'll fight our heritage to save. And rather than submit to shame, to die we would prefer. So cheers for the bunny blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah! 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 hurrah, hurrah for Southern rights! Hurrah! Hurrah for the bunny blue flag that bears a single star! April eighteen sixty one, seceding states had seized most arsenals, forts, arms, and other federal property within their borders, but one fort that still remained in federal hands was the important Fort Sumter, an island in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. The Confederacy demanded its evacuation. When this was refused, President Davis ordered Brigadier General Beauregard to attack it. Bombardment started at 4:30 a.m. on April the 12th, 1861. Sumter's guns replied, but after more than 30 hours bombardment, its garrison surrendered on the afternoon of April the 13th. The Civil War had begun. Southerners rallied to the colors. 
Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee and North Carolina, all of whom had been opposed to secession, now reluctantly joined the Confederate states. The only slave states left in the Union were the border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland and Delaware, later joined by West Virginia. Their support was vital to both sides. Had the North been fighting only to free slaves, the border states would have undoubtedly joined the Confederacy. But Lincoln reassured them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. It is not either to save or destroy slavery. We are springing to the call of our brothers gone before, shouting the battle cry of freedom. And we'll fill the vacant ranks with a million free men more, shouting the battle cry of freedom. The Union forever, hurrah, boys, hurrah. The northern population at the outbreak of war was 22 million, the south 9 million, including 4 million non-combatant slaves. The north was an immense factory, the south was an immense farm. The northern newspapers, confident of victory within a few weeks, called for action. An army, commanded by General McDowell, crossed the Potomac into Virginia. In July, he advanced further into Confederate territory, intending to meet the enemy at Manassas. He was followed by the carriages of congressmen and their ladies, who had brought picnic baskets to sustain them while they watched the fun. The Confederate General Beauregard was in position beside the river Bull Run, near Manassas Junction, Virginia. McDowell struck first. But by nightfall, the Federal troops were throwing down their arms and running from the field, all discipline gone. For the North, Bull Run was a military disaster. But in this case, defeat was better than victory. It dispelled the illusion of an easy war. For the South, victory was worse than defeat. It puffed up our already dangerous feeling of overconfidence. Many of our boys threw away their rifles and came home. Lincoln now placed the Army of the Potomac under the command of General George McClellan. Aged 34 years, McClellan likened himself to Napoleon and always had himself photographed with one arm inside his coat. He was a superb organizer and injected splendid morale into his troops. Marching along, we are marching along. General McClellan had one great failing. He let his army sit idle in camp. He could not bring himself to move into action. The president constantly urged him to cross the Potomac. Lincoln took to visiting McClellan every day to urge him into action. McClellan was merely bored by the visitations. He's the original guerrilla, a teller of low and funny stories. We soldiers thought McClellan a good leader, but we didn't agree with all his ideas. For instance, he wasn't in favor of freeing the slaves. As for the John Brown song, he hated it. But when new words were written to the tune, it became our unofficial marching song. The person who wrote the new words was Mrs. Julia Ward Howe. We were invited one day to attend a review of troops. To beguile the rather tedious drive, we sang snatches of the John Brown song so popular at the time. Mr. Clark said, Mrs. Howe, why do you not write some good words for that stirring tune? I went to bed and slept as usual, but awoke next morning in the grey of early dawn, and to my astonishment found that the wished-for lines were arranging themselves in my brain. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning 
Of his terrible swift sword, his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and lamps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Lincoln continued to visit McClellan and urge him to move. But McClellan always had excuses ready. The Confederate army is too big. The roads are bad. We have the greatest number. We must threaten the enemy. I need more time for training. However, I have now decided on a plan to take Richmond. In March 1862, the Army of the Potomac began to embark on the river transports. McClellan was on the move at last. The first obstacle in his path was Yorktown. Tramp, 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 the boys are marching. Cheer up, comrades, they will come. And beneath the country's flag, we shall breathe the air again. Of the free land in our own beloved home. It took McClellan a month to take Yorktown. The place is bristling with cannon of a formidable size. They were fakes made from logs of wood. Then we fell back to defend Richmond, where we held him for another month. The seven days' battles in June drove McClellan back. The man who beat him was General Lee. Lee remained commander-in-chief of the Confederate Army in Virginia until the end of the war. McClellan's grandiose plan for taking Richmond now had to be abandoned. Towards the end of August, he was watching his dispirited army falling back to its old camping ground by the Potomac near Washington. All quiet along the Potomac. All quiet along the Potomac tonight Except here and there a stray picket Is shot as he walks on his beat to and fro By a rifleman hid in the thicket Tis nothing a private or two now and then will not count in the news of the battle. Not an officer lost, only one of the men. Moaning out all alone the death rattle.
autumn 1862. Encouraged by the incompetence of the Federal armies, General Lee, the Confederate commander, decides to invade the North. He hopes by a series of victories within Federal territory to induce the border states to secede and rally to the Southern cause. They might have done, but for the shortages we were suffering from, the blockade made them worse. After only 18 months of war, the shelves of our food stores in the South had little to offer the customers. New clothes were virtually unknown. As for the Army, our rations were often merely what we could pick up in whatever part of the country we were in. When we met the Yanks in battle, our officers urged us forward with cries of, Adam, lads, there's cheese in their haversacks. Go kill yourself a Yank, boy, get yourself a pair of boots. For clothing, we did best when we captured stores. Rations were short. No man failed to fill his pockets with anything edible he could pick up along the march. The most common free commodity to be had on this campaign was the goober pea, or the peanut. We ate them till they come out of our ears. Sitting by the roadside on a summer day Chatting with my messmates, passing time away Lying in the shadow underneath the trees Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas Peas, 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 goober peas Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas In Maryland, near the river Antietam, Antietam Creek, we call it, McClellan, with 90,000 troops, marched to meet Lee. It was a golden autumn morning. Lines of infantry three miles in length faced each other. When the battle was over, 4,800 men lay dead. Lee, whose troops numbered less than half of McClellan's, could not stand such losses. He decided to retreat back across the Potomac. Lincoln expected McClellan to follow him. Instead, as usual, McClellan had the slows. October the 24th, 1862. Lincoln to McClellan. I have just read your dispatch about sore-tongued and fatigued horses. Will you pardon me for asking what the horses of your army have done since the Battle of Antietam that fatigues anything? November the 5th. By direction of the President, it is ordered that Major General McClellan be relieved from the command of the Army of the Potomac. It is ordered that Major General Burnside take the command of the Army. General Burnside was famous principally for his ornate whiskers. The style came to be known as Side Burns. Eager for a reputation as a fighting general, Burnside launched a stupid frontal attack against Lee at Fredericksburg. A chicken could not have lived in the line of fire we gave him. It was like a slaughter pen, a slaughter pen in which thousands of Union soldiers died. But 1862 was not entirely a year of disappointments for the Union. In the West, in the Mississippi theater of war, one of their generals, hitherto unknown, named Ulysses S. Grant, surprised everybody by capturing the Confederate forts Henry and Donelson and establishing a foothold deep into enemy territory. In April, Grant fought the Confederates at the Battle of Shiloh on the Tennessee River and forced them to retreat. But his own losses were heavy too, and joy at the news of the Shiloh victory was further tempered by the rumour that Grant had been drunk during the battle. A deputation went to see the President and engineer Grant's removal. No, I can't spare this man. He fights and he wins. But, sir, the man drinks. Whiskey. Then find out what brandy drinks and send a few barrels to the other generals. On April the 25th, Admiral Farragut captured New Orleans. By the autumn, all the main strategic points along the Mississippi, except Vicksburg, were in federal hands. In July 1862, Lincoln decided that he could not win the war without freeing the slaves. The preliminary proclamation was issued on September the 22nd, 1862. It was put into force by the Second Proclamation of January 1863, which declared that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, 
all persons held as slaves within any state or part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion, shall be thenceforward and forever free. No more auction block for me. No more, no more. No more auction block for me. Many Negroes laughed and wept. God bless you. God bless Abraham Lincoln. God bless Master Lincoln. But Lincoln had not yet freed the slaves in the five border states. When he came under attack from the New York Tribune for not taking a more radical stand, he sent to Horace Greeley, the editor, this famous reply. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Meanwhile, in the West, after a number of unsuccessful attempts to take Vicksburg, Grant decided to lay siege to it. The besieged garrison soon began to feel the pinch of reduced rations. Mule flesh, which we call Logan's beef, is coarse-grained and darker than beef, but really delicious, sweet and juicy. The flour for our bread, an unhealthy mixture, was made from ground peas. Shelling drove the inhabitants of Vicksburg to seek shelter in trenches or cellars. The town was built on a bluff, high ground with steep slopes above the river Mississippi. Life on the Vicksburg Bluff became very uncomfortable. A life on the Vicksburg Bluff, a home in the trenches deep, where we dodge and shells enough, and our old pea bread won't keep. On Logan's beef I pine, for there's fat on his bones no more. Oh, give me some pork and brine, and truck from a sutler's store. Oh, a life on the Vicksburg Bluff, a home in the trenches deep, where we got jack shells enough, and our old pea bread won't keep. Pea bread, pea bread, our old pea bread won't keep. Pea bread, pea bread, our old pea bread won't keep. Pea bread, pea bread, our old pea bread won't keep. In the spring of 1863, at Chancellorsville in Virginia, the Confederate General Lee won a victory which led him to decide on another invasion of the North during June. Quite by accident at the end of June, our Federal troops met the outriders of Lee's forces near the little town of Gettysburg. 92,000 Federals fought 72,000 of our men in grey for the first three days of July. The outcome was in doubt right to the end. General Lee then made his fatal decision to attack Cemetery Ridge. Of the 15,000 men who marched towards the ridge, only 5,000 returned. The attack was the Confederates' high watermark. From now on, the Southern cause was doomed. After three days' hard fighting, Lee had no choice but to withdraw back across the Potomac. One third of Lee's army were wounded or dead. It was the South's worst defeat of the war. And next day came bad news from the West. Vicksburg had fallen. Four and a half months later, on November the 19th, 1863, while the soldiers' graves were still fresh, the dedication of the National Cemetery with its great memorial arch took place at Gettysburg. The orator of the day was Edward Everett, former governor of Massachusetts. He spoke for one hour and 57 minutes and was greeted with loud, sustained applause. Then it was Lincoln's turn. He delivered a short speech, glancing occasionally at two sheets of paper which he held in his hand. That this nation, under God, 
shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Having finished, he sat down. There was no cheering, and only a few polite, sparse hand claps. There had not even been time to take a good photograph. The press was no more enthusiastic. The Chicago Times. The cheek of every American must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, flat, and dishwatery utterances of the man who has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the President of the United States. London Times. The ceremony was rendered ludicrous by some of the sallies of that poor President Lincoln. Anything more dull and commonplace, it would not be easy to produce. Greed marred the devotion and sacrifice brought forth by the war. Profiteers put their business interests above patriotism. Old blind horses were fobbed off on the army. Boots were supplied with cardboard soles. Uniforms fell to pieces after a few days' wear. As one manufacturer said, My profits, I'm ashamed to say, are painfully large. The South had resorted to conscription in 1862. In 1863, it was necessary to introduce it in the North, where the draft, as it's called in America, was detested and resented. Riots broke out, and Negroes were hanged in the streets. The draft was unfair. Rich boys could hire down-and-outs as substitutes to go in their places, or buy outright exemption for $300. This was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. Recruits weren't drafted. They were grafted into the Union Army. Our Jimmy has gone for to live in a tent. They grafted him into the army. He finally puckered up courage and went when they grafted him into the army. I told. The captains for quarters they said he would pass. They trained him up well in the infantry class. So they grafted him into the army. In March 1864, General Grant was received by Lincoln in Washington and was raised by him to the supreme command of all northern forces. Grant laid his plans to beat Lee and take the Confederate capital. The fighting proved costly. In the course of one month, Grant suffered 50,000 casualties, dead, wounded and missing. He then settled down before Richmond and remained there for nearly a year. The real hero of this period was General Sherman, Sherman had taken over command of the West when Grant moved east, and carrying out Grant's policy, prepared to attack Atlanta, deep in the heart of the South, in Georgia. Sherman was grim-faced, red-bearded, ruthless. He was the first practitioner of total war. In the autumn of 1864, he decided to cut his way from Atlanta to the coast, living off the land as he went. The population of Atlanta was ordered to leave and it was then destroyed by fire. Sherman headed south. Then, after taking Savannah, he turned north into South Carolina. Before the war ended, Sherman had cut an arc of blood, fire and destruction 60 miles wide, 300 miles long, from Atlanta to the sea and deep into the Carolinas. Bring the good old bugle, boys, we'll sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that will start the world along. Sing it as we used to sing it, 50,000 strong, while we were marching through Georgia. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the flag makes you free. So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea. While Sherman was cutting his way through Georgia, Lincoln had been engaged in fighting an election for his second term of office. He gave an inaugural speech for the second time on March the 4th, 1865. 
with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. The end of the war came very suddenly. Grant captured Richmond, much of it in ruins. Lee asked for peace and was granted generous terms of surrender. Grant said, The war is over. The rebels are our countrymen again. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah, we'll give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah, the men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies, they will all turn on and we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. Get ready for the Jubilee, hurrah, hurrah, we'll give the hero three times three, hurrah. Hurrah! The Laura Reed is ready now to place upon his loyal brow And we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home The Southerners straggled back to their homes. Often they found they no longer had a home. General Grant consulted Lincoln. What am I to do, Mr. President, in regard to this conquered people? I do not wish to give any orders on that subject, but if I were in your place, I'd let him up easy. Let him up easy. Less than a week later, Lincoln was dead, killed by the bullet of a mad assassin. The assassination increased the bitterness between the North and the South. Lincoln was succeeded by a very different kind of man, President Andrew Johnson. Lincoln's peaceful, all-forgiving Reconstruction policy was replaced by what Southerners called Reconstruction by Bayonet. Negroes now had votes. Some Southern whites had none. This was bitter medicine. As a result, there arose secret anti-black revenge organizations such as the Ku Klux Klan. How much of such horror could Lincoln have prevented? Perhaps among all the hideous losses of the Civil War, the greatest was the loss of Abraham Lincoln. Many long years ago, many long years ago, In Lincoln Frees the Slaves, written and produced by Charles Chilton, the narrator was John Westbrook, and the readers were Valerie Colgan, Powell Jones, David Healy, and Eddie Matthews. The singers were Pat Whitmore, John Gower, Charles Young, and the Charles Young Choir, with the BBC Midland Light Orchestra, conducted by Alfred Ralston. Lincoln Frees the Slaves was first broadcast in 1972.